Hello, welcome to The Power of One. My name is Brian Berry and I'm the host of the show. This program has been designed to show you that one person can make a difference and that there are many people in our community who are doing just that every single day. It's fantastic today to have with me Steve Sneed, who is a documentary film producer and director. And we'll talk a little bit about um, your recent film. Um, but first of all, we want to get to know you. But thank you for being here today. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Right. I've been looking t forward to this for a long time, okay. actually. OK. Because um, I know you've been working on the film. and so Very hard. Um, I, I've been kind of counting the days, thinking about how can we discuss this and talk about it in a way that helps other people. That's, that so, was the point of the film. Yeah. So, But what I wanted to do first is um, to let people know who you are. So. Okay. What was it like growing up um, here in Pasadena? What was what were your experiences like? And you know, growing up in Pasadena, I had a great childhood. Mm -hmm. I I still have the same friends I grew up with from elementary school, from the neighborhoods, all through school, from high school, college, and current day. You know, so I had a, a tight niche family, and we kind of all lived close. So family was big. Um, Literally, one of my grandmother's houses was literally like a block and a half from my other grandmother's house. So when it came to hanging out with family and seeing my grandmother and seeing my family, I used to just bounce, you know, and just enjoy all the food and the connections and my cousins and just really enjoy that time. And I didn't realize how lucky I was to have that until you get older and then things are different. Yeah, and even probably at that time, there were other people who you knew who didn't have that kind of tight circle. Absolutely. Absolutely, and that's not to say that there still weren't challenges, you know. There was lots of challenges in the home. I grew up in the 80s, so that was, I'm an 80s baby, so growing up in the 90s, you know, 80s into the 90s, you know, you kind of see some things impact your family, like the drugs and things like that. So in the neighborhood, it was, it was, it was drugs. And my parents were impacted, and my uncles were impacted. Yeah. So even being in that loving community, you still saw some of these ills from society, even within your own home. So what do you think then kept you from going down that path or, or maybe moving into a negative direction? Man, my foundation was pretty solid. I, I have to give a lot of credit to my mom yeah. and a lot of credit to my grandmothers. Both of those, all those people were very influential figures who kind of like kept that guidance and love to be like, hey, don't do these certain things and just trying to really explain why and they didn't have to explain too much because I started to see with my own eyes the negative um, consequences that were starting to happen mm -hmm. with even my own family you know what I mean when I started seeing family go to jail yeah. and I started seeing family get shot and I started seeing family pass away you know it's like you you start to see what is happening and then you start to you know I I start to internalize like do I want that to be me yeah. and look at the consequences that are happening from what they're doing. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you is how psychologically or emotionally, how do you separate yourself from that or how do you protect yourself from um, that kind of atmosphere or some of those activities? I mean, I, I, I honestly think it's a personality trait. Like, I, mm. you know, even growing up around my peers, you know, I was never like a tough guy. I wanted to engage anybody or a fighter. I was always cool with everybody and wanted to talk and hang out and get to know each other and build relationships. So I just kind of think it wasn't me. You know what I mean? Like I've been in the times growing up and in certain activities and you kind of see your peers part ways and certain people start to get engaged in certain things. And for me, it was just like, that's not really my lifestyle. And there was lots yeah. of temptation. And I even have a lot of buddies who are involved in certain things and it never changed my love for them because I still interact with them today. Mm -hmm. But it just definitely made me want to choose a different path for myself. You know, the way you're, t you're describing this makes me reflect on my own life. Right. And so one of my grandmothers lived over by, um, actually both of them lived by Marshall. Okay. One was above um, up Allen and the other one was down Allen okay. um, on a street called Las Lunas. So it was like every week we were like Tuesday nights at one grandma's and, right. and then Sunday nights at the other grandma's. Right. So I think that um, that nurturing or that um, supportive family yeah. played a big role because I had friends too who were into knucklehead things and um, making poor decisions. Absolutely. But um, having family around me really made a big difference. So it sounds like it did the same for you. Oh yeah, I, I appreciated my family. I mean, even 
the things that weren't always going your way, you know, you realize people aren't perfect. You know what I mean? My parents made mistakes, but it took me to get a little older to realize that they're people too. As growing up and you see them as your parental figures, yeah. you expect them to be perfect. And oh, yeah. you expect them to carry out everything, you know, no flaws, no hiccups. But, you know, you get a little older and you realize that they've had challenges growing up and they had unmet needs and they had circumstances to overcome. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize how that affects you. So being a grown man and you look back and I'm like, I really, really appreciate it now because, you know, thinking of all the support from my grandmothers and even when my uncles were into these activities and drugs, they still had that love for us, even in yeah. the midst of it. So yeah. it's like, you know. I think what it's done for you too is to have a sense of appreciation for, for what they did, but I right. think also um, what some people call grace or it's being kind and thoughtful to those people and understanding that their lives were complicated and yeah. difficult and not, yeah. not condemn them. Yeah, I mean, yes, and that's hard to do for a lot of people because, you know, I know just some of my people, they look at their own family members and they're just like, well, he wasn't there for me and she wasn't there for me and I didn't yeah. like this and I didn't like that. And I'm sure I've had moments like that also, but you know, as we get older, I think it, it comes to a point where you just be like, they're still my family. Right. I love them. I wish them well. I may not be as connected. We may not speak all the time, but I care about you. When I do see you, it's all love right. and I wish nothing but the best on you. Yeah, I try to practice that as well, but I'm glad you said that because I need to remind myself to do it. I think it. we all do at times. Absolutely. So um, I wanted to try to figure out why you wanted to do this film because, um, I mean, obviously, so, so a few facts. Pasadena, of course, has um, had significant gang activity. Right. And in the 80s and 90s, uh, for example, especially with the crack academic, yeah. uh, Epidemic. Yeah, got it. Yeah. There was um, a lot of violence, yeah. a tremendous amount of violence, and people don't. People think of Pasadena as this quiet, bucolic sort of a, um, you know, uh, city where there are no big challenges. Right. But um, you and I know that that's not the case. Right. So in the 80s and 90s, we were averaging between 30 and 40 homicides a year. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the peak was over 40. And I can remember in 96 or 97 doing a march where right. we were honoring the people who had had. I got some of those pictures in a documentary, by the way, but go ahead. Great, I'm glad you did that. Right. Um, so it was a huge issue. Right. Obviously it's changed now it's a lot know, less, 20, yeah. 20 years later. Yeah. But there, it still persists. Mm -hmm. So why was it that that you wanted to utilize this mechanism to Well, I'm going to start it. back a little bit. Um, growing up here, I was impacted. You know what I mean? Like, it was in the family. It was in the neighborhood. It was yeah. at the school. It was at the parks. So it was like everywhere you go, you kind of see this thing. And to maneuver and navigate to not be, effect, uh, not be impacted or I'm looking for the right term, like uh, a victim of it. Oh, yeah. If you you kind of have to you yeah, know know your surroundings and luckily when this is your area you know you you create a lot of relationships and I just think growing up being impacted by it I mean we've had some some scary nights just coming home being teenagers coming home from school yeah. you know what I'm saying from from actually witnessing someone get shot and die to um, witnessing people get jumped beat up to witnessing people rolling up on us asking us where we're from and we're not even you know. Um, affiliated to being rolled up on and have guns put on us on a couple of times. Mm -hmm. To be a young man 17 and under experience these type of things and these are traumatic experiences and they live with you and I never really talk about these things until I've gotten to this point where we're creating this thing to really shed light on this problem. Yeah. But that's like just a little background to have those experiences being some close calls where I thought at any moment me and my brothers could have lost our life was scary mm -hmm. and it sits with me. And I think about it from time to time, and it's mm. like, wow, I'm, a, I'm appreciative to still be here to even tell a story, to talk about this. But that's not why I did the film. Um, when I got hired for PUSD as the uh, district-wide intervention specialist, I was asked to put together something to address gang violence. And I thought this was very innovative from the school district point of view to even have mm. this conversation with the kids, right? I was like, oh, this is amazing. I'm glad I'm the person to do this because I think I could present this in a way 
for people to understand, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I did, and I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to get a chance to do that. And when I created this presentation, I got a chance to present to some middle schoolers and some high schoolers. And after the presentation, the kids would come up to me and talk to me and just really share some way out stories that you would never think mm -hmm. a high schooler or middle schooler would have, would to, have with. to express, experience, or be yeah. a part of. And they were just connecting with me and we were vibing. And I'm kind of sharing some things not too deep for them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and when I saw their interest peak and it just gave me an idea. So I got invested. I really enjoyed doing that. And I was mm -hmm. disappointed when I couldn't do it no longer. So when I eventually got laid off, I thought to myself, I was devastated. I was a little like, oh man, I really enjoy this job. I worked hard to get here and boom, now it's gone. Yeah. So now I'm like, okay, this is reality. Um, you know, things happen. Uh, you know, I've been hearing about funding and PUSD since forever. Mm. And so I couldn't fault anyone. It's just like, wow, well, what do I do? How, so because I spent the last year and a half investing in this thing and creating this thing and creating this presentation and looking up these facts and looking up all these things, when I no longer had the gig, I was like, I don't want my efforts to die. How, how do I continue this? How do I take everything that I was doing and mold it into this thing to be helpful? And because of me and all my brothers are in the arts and into music, I was like, I woke up one morning just, I'm gonna do a film. And it was really like that. I, I, after being laid off, I think I sat for about two weeks just trying to understand what am I going to do. I've never been unemployed. This is the first time. I'm terrified. I'm like, yeah. but I want to still make something. And I want to still create something impactful. So once I decided in my mind that this is something I wanted to do, I reached out to my brother and I was like, look, I'm thinking about doing this documentary on gang violence. But I said, but the twist is we're not glorifying the gang aspect yeah. of it. We want to really connect with people, talk about it, and hear what people who've been affected feel solutions could be or should be. And all my brothers jumped on board. Then I started just reaching out to people and just sharing and talking about it and brainstorming. Then I started writing it down and slowly it became real. And then and because I didn't have official employment, oh, I hit the ground running. Right. I made this film my job. I woke up every morning, still at seven and eight o'clock. I'm on the freeway, I'm here, I'm calling people on Facebook and I'm emailing, I'm showing up, I'm talking to people, community members, parents, and everybody has such a positive response. There was a few people that were like, nah, I like what you're doing, but that's not something I wanna be a part of. But so far, my experience has been so many people are overwhelmed with the positivity of what this can be. But you know, what's really interesting is, and I think we're going to circle back to this thought, but you just filled in um, a piece of the puzzle that I wasn't aware of before. See? And that's um, this whole notion that when you were working as the intervention yeah. specialist, yeah. they actually asked you to do some research on gang intervention and Abs prevention. Absolutely. So it was a continuation of that project. Right. Here I thought it was something that uh, yeah, you know, Steve yeah. had been wanting to do for decades. And True, and that, that part is true. But I never but conceptualized gave, doing it this way. I didn't know how that was going to happen. Right. And that gave you the, the pathway. Exactly. Because now I have platform. all, I now I got this folder of information. I got this presentation that I put together. I have these things. Right. I got research presentations, uh, stats, statistics, um, you know, and all these different variables. And I'm looking at all these sites and gathering all this information. And then I'm like, well, what do I do with it? So mm -hmm. being from here, I felt like this would be a great vessel to get it out. You know what I mean? To get it to the people to just see it and acknowledge it and be a part of it and hopefully enlighten somebody and learn and and, and it's a lot of insightful moments yeah can you share one of those moments what what happened that was surprising or a story about what and you don't need to share names at all because I know um, some of it is um, uh, you know I, I, I enjoyed every interview um, but it was something about speaking to the parents that lost their children yeah. that really just sits with you because, like, that's, that's a, an experience that I don't, you know, I don't, 
it's just one of those experiences that's hard to even talk about. Yeah. So for them to open up to talk to me about it on camera, just so other people can learn from it, I think that's amazing. You know what I mean? Even some of the brothers who lived that life and maybe even some of them that still do, were able to really sit down and, and think of positive things to share about that lifestyle, kind of like them either coming out of it or yeah. even if they're still a part of it, they're starting to conceptualize, you know, maybe there's other options. And to have people who've been impacted greatly share their story, I think is gonna impact others because, you know, because I wasn't necessarily in the lifestyle, I was impacted. But when you're speaking to the youth, they wanna know it's authentic and real. They wanna hear it straight from the person. Yeah. Like, I can tell stories all day, but I'm gonna say, hey, look, I'm gonna connect you with this brother who's actually been mm -hmm. through it, been shot, almost died, been stabbed, went to jail, came home, went to jail again. And if you hear it from him, you may have a different outlook on the whole thing as a whole. Yeah, the, the part that you're talking about that I think um, is really impressive, I can't even imagine, you know, I have nieces and nephews, I can't even imagine losing one of them, but right. to lose your own child and then to have the courage to be able to speak about it and to speak authentically and passionately, right. I think that's just um, extraordinary. I, think I, I do too, and I commend those parents who took part of it. I'm not gonna say names now, the documentary is coming and I don't wanna, you know, I just want yeah, that's to be fine. there. But I, it was definitely one of those moments for me just to sit and speak with these parents and, and you could just see the hurt and hear it in their voices yeah. and the passion and, and for the sake of really helping somebody else. It's like, how do you get over that? I don't think you do. Yeah. I don't think you do. I think there's going to always just be this emptiness of, I lost my kid to this. And I think, you know, you know, I have a buddy who lost a son, and it wasn't even to gang violence, but even him, he struggles every day. Yeah. And, you know, so I can only imagine. Yeah. And part of the reason why you're doing this is to help prevent that from happening again. Right. I, you know, I don't want to jump ahead, but people, no, people keep asking me, what do you want people to take away from this? Like, yeah. first of all, there's, when I say talking about gangs, I think there's a big mis misconception. I think a lot of people think that we're gonna be talking about, oh, the dirt that people did and who got shot and where and, and which, the violence. And which gangs they were and, which and gangs what colors they, they were from, wore. And, and what kind of missions they went on yeah. and who did what and who. That is totally not what we're focusing on. Good. This whole documentary, not once do we ever discuss what gang you're from. Well, I'm we glad to talk I'm, about those things. I'm glad to hear that because that glorifies uh, exactly. the activity. And we didn't go into what set are you from, what did you do, um, who, you know, we didn't get into all that. It was really centered around, you know, preventative things like what do they think would have prevented it for them and, you know, kind of what led them down this path and then like their turning points and then ultimately like what do they think solutions, like from, from their perspective, yeah. being, you know, an adult now, looking back like what do they think would have helped them what type of solutions could they come up with and mm -hmm. man people come up with some great stuff and i'm hoping when people watch it pe the collaborations are made like oh man this person said something really cool this person had a great idea maybe if we hybrid these pieces together we could come up with something that might be very powerful and impactful for the youth mm -hmm. and you've you've been in the city a while obviously yeah. um how have those partnerships developed for you? Where, can you give an example of, of a collaborative I can, activity? I can. I've, I've been a part of a lot of things. Um, I think initially, I started in, at Longfellow Elementary School in 1999. I was 19 years old. I was going to say, right? you were so, pretty young. So starting that early, it kind of started to pave a path because as I'm working and trying to like really becoming an adult, I'm starting to understand the importance of being responsible. And then for the first time, people are looking up to me. Mm. So now I'm put in a position where I have to, you know, display leadership qualities and share. And, and being at one school for so long, you start to build relationships, not just with the kids, but to the community and to the parents. And you start to be present and they start looking at you as this figure. You're Mr. Sneed now. Like right. you, 
you are a fixture of this school. You are a support system that we appreciate. And having those people who work there as the principals and the support staff and office managers and teachers kind of like embracing me as the new young guy, encouraging me. Like I went back to school to get my degree because of that support at Longfellow. Mm -hmm. So that support there already sparked me to go back and, and finish and, and get my education and be, get my bachelor's degree. Never thought I would get a degree. Uh, education was you know talked about but it wasn't really pushed and I didn't really have a direction of what I wanted to be I didn't want I didn't know I wanted to go to school I didn't know what I wanted to go to mm -hmm. school for um, I graduated from college at 30 years old you know what I mean so it was just having that was one support and then you get older and then people come into your life and, and you start taking on mentorships yeah. right and then as of late you know you start I started to kind of like try to connect myself to people like I did you guys this Pasadena neighborhood neighborhood leadership course right. that you facilitate and I think that was very positive to see so many like-minded people in the city come together to just want to cause change amazing you know what I mean and um, yeah. the reason why I ask the question is sometimes we find collaboration difficult or partnership awkward and oftentimes people want to stick with their own mission or just stick with their own program right and not uh, think about how do we work together right um, I mean so I'm I, glad to hear you I, I think good well I've always been like a team player like it, it, if I say I'm going to do something I do it mm -hmm. uh, at least to the best of my ability and, you know, I think when you're even going into collaborating, I think you just got to be open to it because, you know, if you're collaborating, everyone's not going to agree on everything. But it's about the mission. What are we trying yeah. to get done here and how can we all do it? I look at it as that simple. Um, obviously, sometimes personalities clash and everybody doesn't always get along. But I believe if, if you take on a project and you want to be a part of something, you know, it's collaborative, then you kind of got to be open. Yeah. Yeah. Let's. I want to explore another topic. You're now kind of an expert in this field or in this area. <laughs> um, I don't know about expert, but I'm, you're, I'm here. You're pretty I'm knowledgeable. About it. So I want to know what you've learned about violence. So a lot of people feel like the United States is, if not the most violent, one of the most violent uh, countries on the planet. Um, there's a lot of discussion about that. At the very least, we know that uh, approximately 30,000 people are killed with weapons every year, um, which is a, an extraordinary number. When you think about um, comparisons, that's like maybe three Sierra Madres or one and a half South Pasadenas. Um, so it's a lot of folks. Um, so from your perspective and some of right. the people you talk to, why, why do we have this violent tendency? What, what sparks people in our um, society to, to, ha to move toward violence instead of using other right. ways? I can't say that I already, uh, I just know the answer to that because that would be a little much to say. Um, when I think about violence, I just initially think of, you know, the grassroots and upbringing, the socioeconomic development. I think of who's in your life. I think of the type of opportunities you have. Is there resources near you, in your community, in your home? And you start to, you know, it's like you look at somebody and it's like, you know, coming from mental health background and working with the, it's like you do an assessment. You know, you're mm -hmm. sitting there looking at it, you're kind of just checking off the marks. Like, did you, do you have? Um, so if people don't have those, then they, they might be more likely to be violent. I'm guessing. I don't know. I, I think there's going to be some extreme cases one way or the other. I think there's going to be some people who came from total chaos and just made a choice to not replicate what they yeah. saw. And then I think there's going to be people that are greatly impacted, especially like when we're talking about this, um, gangs particularly, sometimes generational. So, uh, gangs been around a while now, so it, they may have come from a lineage of uh, gang activity, and it may not be looked at as a gang to them. They look at it like, this is my family. My family's from this. Right. We do this. This is something that is built into me. So it's not looked at as we're gang members. It's like, this is just my family. So Yeah, lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, it, this is just the lifestyle we live. And, and, you know, that's hard for some people to understand. But some that's really how it is in some cases. Mm -hmm. So, but back to my original point, I think it's just, you know, a lot of variables go into it. I can't just say because someone was poor they wouldn't pick up a gun or because they didn't have a father they wouldn't pick up a gun. That'd be not fair to say because people come from good homes and good schools and, and go off and do these things as well. 
So mm -hmm. I don't know. No. You do know. You just gave a great. <laughs> you just gave a great answer. Yes, because it it's yes. layered. It's it's layered. It's, I mean, it's, and it's not, different strokes for different folks. It's you know not. I mean? If they, you know, if we had solved this a long time, ago, or if we had the answer to that question, yeah. you know, uh, violence. Yeah, a lot would, of people wouldn't have jobs. Yeah. So let's let's for the last few minutes let's focus on how we can um, utilize your film to reduce violence in Pasadena or. Or what is your thought for utilizing the film? You know what? Or to create in, in the creation of the film, I definitely want the film to be a tool to explore different perspectives. It's like because sometimes we get so caught up on one end of it that we didn't zoom out and look at other aspects. So I think this film, what it mm. does is it shares so many different perspectives that we can kind of have a bigger scope on the topic. And I think having so many diverse people talking about the same issue is enlightening because it's like you get to really see how different people are mm -hmm. affected. And that's a conversation worth having because yeah. this is our community. This is where we all dwell. This is where we live. We want to be safe. Um, the new generation is coming up. We're having kids. And it's like as people are growing up, we don't want them to have to go through the same thing that we did. Right? So you'll have multiple screenings around the community? I plan, how's that, how that going to work? I plan, you know what, I got a lot of plans, probably too many plans to discuss here in this last minute or two, but I definitely want to keep making it available to the community. It's free. We did all the hustling and we did the GoFundMe, so I want to thank everybody who who contributed to the GoFundMe, everyone Good. who bought a t-shirt, everyone who supported, all the um, um, organizations who helped fund it. I'm gonna give a special shout out to a couple of them because Day One did a great job supporting mm -hmm. this, and Flint Ridge Center did a great job supporting this, Good. and even Stars did a great job supporting this. So I, I, after the movie is aired, we're having the big premiere tomorrow night at 7.30 at the Limley Theater, and it's invite only, but it's free and that is all booked out. But I plan to either try to do another one in that setting, but we got some community people who are who are inviting us to bring this there. So I want to keep making this accessible because I think a lot of people can learn a lot from it. Yeah. And in schools too, right? And that was my other thing. I, yeah, I definitely want to make it available to hit the schools because I think for our middle school and our high school students, although this is raw, I think it'd be a great tool for them to see because it shares so many perspectives. I think they can gain so much from listening and learning and just having that moment. Yeah, well, it's an extraordinary piece of work, and I'm so glad that I was part of it. Yeah, I appreciate engaged you with it. it. It's yeah. been a fantastic journey, and I appreciate so much what you've done, and our, our community is vastly better for it. So yeah. I look forward to seeing how the impacts will go and, yeah, me too. and how it'll you be know. utilized. I can't just say, oh, my movie is going to solve gang violence, but I just wanted to make my mark with my talents, my art, my know-how, and put out something that I think will be beneficial, positive, and powerful to our people. Thank you so much. Thank I'm you. glad you were here today. I appreciate it. And Thank I'm waiting Brian. for my t-shirt. <laughs> I got you. I got you at the screening.